Hello and welcome to Automation World's webinar on digitizing complex discrete manufacturing processes to accelerate your competitiveness. My name is Renee Bassett and I am Deputy Editor of Automation World. Manual methods of gathering, sharing, and reporting data related to manufacturing processes are common, established, and often effective. Digital processes and workflows linked to manufacturing execution systems, however, can create more effective operations, eliminate wasted production time, and enable higher quality at lower cost. Digitized processes bring data to and from three types of automated systems. Enterprise Resource Planning, or ERP, Manufacturing Execution Systems, or MES, and Product Lifecycle Management, or PLM. The combination can help make a manufacturer more competitive. We've compiled a panel of experienced presenters to show you how. Bob Gates is Global Marketing Director for Manufacturing for GE Intelligent Platforms, maker of automation software and systems for discrete, hybrid, and continuous process industries. His previous experience includes engineering leadership positions at General Motors, Hoffman LaRoche, and Pfizer. Jack Fayette is Global Industry Manager for GE Intelligent Platforms. There he works with end user companies, systems integrators, machine builders, and others to define and implement high availability control systems. And Matt Sheridan is the Director of PLM Product Marketing for PTC, maker of Product Lifecycle Management, Application Lifecycle Management, and Service Lifecycle Management software. Matt started his career with Baker Hughes Processing, designing large slurry filtration devices for the chemical industry. 20 years later with PTC, he is helpli helping to implement CAD and PLM software for customers like NASA and Lockheed Martin. Today's webinar will last approximately 45 minutes, and then there will be 15 minutes for questions. You may submit questions at any time using the chat function on your screen. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand through AutomationWorld.com. Now, without further delay, Bob Gates. Well, thank you very much, Renee. <clears throat> and this is Bob Gates. Uh, today I'd like to take you through our thoughts on digitizing uh, complex discrete manufacturing processes. Real quick look at the agenda for you. We're going to introduce GE Intelligent Platforms, the division of GE. Uh, that is its technology base, uh, go through uh, PTC and introduce them, and then we'll talk about accelerating and competitive advantage. So let me cover GE Intelligent Platforms. Uh, we are the manufacturing technology arm of GE, meaning that all of the products that you'd be talking about with us are products that we use in our 150-something uh, manufacturing facilities around the world. And we do that because we, as the Intelligent Platforms Group, really enable people to connect to the world. We start off with military and aerospace, for example, where we work on highly um, embedded computing systems, ruggedizing electronics, if you will, and what we learn from that world uh, follows right into our controls and communication systems pieces so that we can help you connect to the machines that are out there on your factory uh, that may or may not be uh, brand new, that could be uh, like ours, in many cases decades and decades old. And why we do that, the connection is to get to that software layer so we can give you some very rich visualizations and capabilities to look at your machinery and your processes in a totally different way, bringing real operational intelligence to the picture. And we, as you might have seen or heard, is we're talking very much about the industrial internet. You've seen it on TV as brilliant machines. Uh, I'd like to take a second or two just to kind of talk about that. You know, using those connections, as I mentioned before, you know, you connect your machines, your facilities, your fleets, your operations, all the way through to your end product so that you can fully understand how that machine was not only built, uh, but how it works out in the field. Bring in that advanced analytic capabilities along for the ride to help people at work really do the best job they can. This is our mission. And our mission is <clears throat> to empower the people with the tools that enable them to be le level, uh, new levels of productivity at every single uh, phase of, of their career and their life in the equipment building process. We connect the OEM equipment to the big data industry internet so that we can work faster and answer problems and answer questions faster. 
And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Matt so he can introduce PTC. Matt. Hey, thanks, Bob. So again, my name is Matt Sheridan. I work with PTC. Uh, for those of you not familiar with PTC, we are a software company that was founded back in 1984. Back then, our flagship product was ProEngineer. And over the last 30 years, we've been continuing to expand to help companies transform the way they create and service products. And what that means is we have solutions today that cover these key areas. So starting on the left with CAD, we started by revolutionizing how 3D CAD software works. And today we continue to advance the intelligence that goes into the CAD model to include manufacturing, model-based engineering, and measurement and inspection. Moving to ALM, over the uh, last few years, we've expanded to include managing software development and lifecycle coordination with product development. And this really gets at the embedded software that comes in many of the products that we see today, uh, some of the brilliant products that Bob just mentioned. Moving to SLM, this is delivering and capturing product knowledge at the point of service. So as we work with our customers, we see more OEMs focusing on service to improve their business and help their customers. And having a clear understanding of the product definition out in the world of service is a key part of this. This is helping with service knowledge at the call centers, parts catalogs, and warranty management. At the bottom is supply chain management. Here we're aligning product design and supply chain planning strategies. This is helpful up front in the design process to improve decisions during the design itself so you can uh, have the right vendors and manufacturers. It also leads into areas like material management and now conflict minerals, which is a big area that uh, is coming to bear on the marketplace. And then in the middle is PLM, which is product lifecycle management. And here this is managing the evolution of the complete product definition over the entire life cycle. And as you can see, connecting all these different areas that go into the overall product definition. And if you peel that back a layer, uh, we can see a little bit more. And I'll show you that in a, in a slide in a minute. So that's what we do. Uh, who we are as a company, we are the recognized global leader in product development. And what you can see is we are very strong in the number of employees. We have 6,000 roughly employees worldwide, close to 2,000 employees in research and development, about 1,400 service professionals who are out working in the marketplace today with our customers to institute best practices around using our products to achieve a competitive advantage. We have 27,000 roughly active customers with 1.4 million seats of our flagship uh, PLM product, Winchell, and in the marketplace, close to 2 million total active seats. We also have a, have a very strong sense of community. We have a uh, VAR partnership program with over 750 uh, participants. We have 10 million students who have trained through our PTC Global Academic Program. We're a very strong uh, advocate of the STEM programs. And an example of that is we actually are a corporate sponsor of the FIRST program, which is a program that uh, high school students can build robots using engineering skills and, and knowledge uh, that then compete. And this is actually a, a very uh, growing worldwide event. Uh, it's a lot of fun. So that's a brief introduction to PTC. I'm now going to turn it over to uh, Jack, who's going to take you through GE. Okay, hello everybody. This is Jack. So we're going to get down to the to the heart of the matter here and start to talk about uh, accelerating your competitive advantage in in discrete manufacturing. So you know, here at, at General Electric and, and PTC, I mean, we're in the we're in the business of uh, of helping manufacturers optimize their their production operations um, and working, as Bob said, both in with our with our GE manufacturing brothers and sisters as well as some external customers. We've been able to achieve some real proven Measurable, measurable results, which are which are represented here, and our intent today is to show you, tell you, show you how we've achieved some of those results. So getting getting to the end game is you know doesn't come without some challenges, okay? And so we've uh, uh, basically started this journey with um, by 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 working with our manufacturing 
uh, companies within within General Electric and basically did a voice of the customer survey with over 20 GE manufacturing executives um, to understand what their challenges were in their discrete manufacturing environments and and these are these are the results of that as well as some some early adopters of the of the solutions that we'll talk about today so um, they're probably not anything new to you um, there's a lot of them are are uh, accomplished by through through lean lean processes but just to talk about them quickly you know producing products faster starting at the at the top of the page, I mean, this is all about, in the end, reducing your cycle times. And it's not only your cycle times within your, within your manufacturing processes, but, but your cycle times from, from product conception to design to, to, to manufacturing to putting the cut product in your, in your customer's hands. You know, reducing WIP, I mean, this is all about um, uh, visual, visualization. I mean, uh, especially in, in large, complex, discrete manufacturers where where uh, paper-based systems are still in use, um, visibility into into what what material and what uh, your schedules are on the floor can can be cumbersome. Tighter control on quality. I mean, every every discrete manufacturer is looking to improve their quality and tighten that up. Um, and this comes down to the ability to uh, basically ensure that you're building products right the first time, in order to mitigate any uh, any problems in the in the field. Uh, streamlining your supply chain many ways to, 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 to streamline the supply chain, but there's the two key aspects here. Again, just like WIP, is visibility into your supply chain, what they're building and when they're building it and, and when they would deliver it. And then once they deliver it, ensuring that they've conformed to the, to the right standards um, that you require, uh, whether it be regulatory or, or customer requirements. Um, and then uh, reducing warranty costs. You know, there's often a, a significant cost tied to identifying the scope of a problem, especially in a in a, in a, in a paper-based uh, manufacturing environment. So the intent here is to, is to streamline that and make that data more accessible so that you can do some, some quick uh, uh, exposure containment. And then finally, reducing costs. I mean, that's, a, that's obviously a big bucket there, but by impacting one or all of these uh, challenges here, um, you're bound to, to reduce some costs across your manufacturing spectrum. So how do how do we do that? How do we meet some of these challenges? And again, working with with our with our uh, manufacturing companies within General Electric and the uh, early adopters of these solutions, we we basically come up with some business drivers to help achieve uh, and and meet some of these challenges. Okay. So if I start at the left side of the page, I'm not going to go through all of these. There's a there's a fair amount of detail on the page, but you know just to single out a few. You know if I if I enable single piece flow manufacturing. Um, as well as uh, uh, afford the opportunity to repurpose product modules and parts and, and designs um, from assembly to assembly, if you will, that's going to, that's going to help me produce products faster. Um, enabling just-in-time material delivery um, and reusing common components will, will afford me the opportunity to free up some force, floor space, uh, perhaps even to reduce my rework um, as, as I'm building, and to uh, overall reduce my cost of inventory, which has an impact on, on reducing your WIP. Uh, standard proven processes um, to close the loop on quality between manufacturing and, and, and engineering, um, to eliminate process waste and, and, and meet uh, your design specifications and, and or regulations is going to tighten up control on your, on your quality. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the, again, the ability to, uh, to provide visibility into your supply chain um, from what they're delivering and when they're going to deliver it as well, the quality aspect will help you to eliminate some so the uh, supplier bottlenecks that you may be experiencing in order to streamline your supply chain. And then finally, when it, it all comes down to, in the end, to be able to, to, to have some data to show that your as-built is consistent with your as-designed, that you're building product right the first time in order to do um, any warranty containment and recall exposure limitation in order to reduce your warranty costs. So with that, I'm, I'm going to uh, turn it back over to Matt to talk to us a little bit about um, the problems with disparate systems within a manufacturing environment. Okay, thanks, Jack. So as you mentioned, there's definitely some challenges out there today, and a lot of those challenges have arisen due to the traditional systems that have been put in place. Uh, if you go back again years into uh, when the computer was first taking hold inside of manufacturing organizations, the different groups found different solutions to handle the specific problems they were dealing with. So planning, quality, operations, design. 
Uh, the result of that is we now have systems that are not integrated, siloed. Uh, in many cases, you have paper-based processes to connect these different systems, and quality is not visible throughout the entire process. So if you break this down even further, and you take a look at the challenges that uh, we often see out there with the different silos that are happening inside these organizations, if you start up in the upper left-hand corner with design, uh, the design group is bringing in customer requirements. They're pulling these together to create the product definition. That includes the 3D models, the drawings, uh, a lot of the information that goes into uh, some of the manufacturing processes. This information then needs to be connected with what becomes the manufacturing view. And this view is going to be reorganizing the engineering view, uh, in many cases the EBOM, into what becomes a, a manufacturing view. However, in, in a lot of cases, this information is not connected. And so you end up with uh, data that's not propagated, and you lose some of the rich history that comes with the design information. The manufacturing view needs to continue down in the process and become the manufacturing plan, at which point now you're taking information, developing a specific manufacturing bill of material, a bill of process, the specific uh, steps and routing that are going to take place out on the shop floor. And once again, data is uh, not translated, and it often requires manual export, manual import. When we get to the shop floor execution, now we need to actually have information inside the uh, manufacturing execution system. The operators who are going to be working want to have the information uh, available to them. Again, at this point, this might be recreated, or it's new information that uh, has to be put in manually. And again, we're not propagating the, the rich information. After we go through uh, the shop floor execution, uh, we get to quality inspection. This, uh, again, you need uh, information around testing and planning uh, that should have come from back all the way up in the design world. Uh, when we come down to quality inspection, that information can be recorded in a completely different system again. The quality engineer might be working off of a separate piece of information and uh, does not have a tie into the rest of the process. If information is not uh, is found, uh, if there's an issue found in quality, and we now need to close the loop and bring this back, that often can be a challenge because uh, problem reports are their own separate system. That could be a spreadsheet, it could be an uh, email system, uh, and again, that's now taking the information one step away from uh, the rest of the process. And then at the end, when we're finished with uh, production, we want to know that uh, what was built actually can match up to what was as designed. But again, because we've possibly translated this information and exported and imported out of different systems, it's difficult to go back and make an assessment of does this as built actually uh, meet the as designed. So those are definitely some of the challenges. And what we're seeing and what we're talking about is eliminating these silos. So throughout the product life cycle, from concept, design, planning, production, and support, we want to have a unified environment that gives us the opportunity to eliminate many of those challenges that I just outlined. And this looks like uh, three main systems that really come into play. So PLM, which is taking in the requirements. It's driving the innovation of the product. And it's helping pass this information out to uh, the customer and out to the services organizations who are going to be using that information. When it comes to uh, MES, the manufacturing, we need to be able to execute and have confidence that the information we're executing against matches what came from design. We want to make sure that we have flexibility. And we want to make sure that we're able to reduce factors like WIP. And that happens with confidence in the product information. And then, of course, ERP is still a, a key component. Uh, that's handling areas, especially in the supply chain, whether that be procurement, uh, the overall inventory, sales configurators, and sales configuration to take in orders that might go directly to uh, production. So with these three areas working together, you can bring a, a vision of a much greater uh, productivity to the overall production life cycle. When you stretch that out, you can take now the what to build, which is the CAD and the product design, 
marry that and connect it with the how to build it. This is the manufacturing bill of material and the routings that would come off of that, the, the overall planning. And then it goes to the where and when to build it. So we want to have a production layout and the product execution. And when we connect all of those, we can do it with a backbone of quality. And this allows us to make a closed loop quality system. And if you look at these systems working together, as we saw on the last slide, you have PLM handling uh, a lot of the what to build and how to build it, MES on the where and when to build it, ERP across the, the top in terms of uh, systems like human resources and other aspects. But you end up with a connected system, a closed loop quality process, and the ability to do synchronization between as designed and as built products. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jack, who's going to give us some more detail about GE's prophecy system. Thank you, Matt. So uh, Matt talked about the ideal system. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is what we call the journey to the ideal system. And you know, working with uh, some forward-thinking manufacturers today that, that, that recognize the need to integrate these systems together um, in order to eliminate their paper-based processes and, and do some, some automated uh, collection, if you will, if you, of, their, of their product production and, and quality data, we've, uh, we've, we've developed a, basically a step-by-step -step journey or a methodology in order to help you uh, digitize your, your processes within manufacturing with the intent of, of uh, eliminating paper, if you will, along the way. So I'm going to walk through that step-by-step, -step, and this is a a methodology that we've implemented at, at, at a number of uh, a number of our customers. So that the first the first the first step in the in in the journey here is is all about data creation. It's about digitizing your process, and, and typ typically this will happen in your in your engineering or your product lifecycle management systems. Okay, and this is where you're go now going to take and create digitized forms of those uh, paper-based work orders, if you will, which, which typically get delivered to the to the plant floor. The routings that are associated associated with those. I mean, where do they go when they're when they're completed? The uh, the work instructions. This is the uh, the step by step procedures that an operator needs to walk through in order to uh, assemble um, whatever widget he is working on. The approval workflow. So once a, an operation is done, what approval metrics need to be be done in order to move it on to the next operation, and then and then resource certification. Um, this is all about uh, ensuring that the right person, the right machine, the right station is uh, is available to uh, to assemble the the product that you're that you're you're putting together. So now you've created the data. What do you do with that? So the, obviously the next step is is that we need to uh, uh, we need to deliver that to the to the plant floor. Okay. So this is where we now are starting to transfer information down and from the from the engineering environment to the, uh, to the manufacturing execution systems in order to enable the plant personnel um, uh, in, the, in the production environment. So this is all about data delivery. Okay? This is delivering in an electronic form the dispatch lists, you know, what their schedules are for the day, the uh, operation and job execution sequence. So when they, get a, when, they get a, when they get a job, what sequence do they need to, to do things in, and then the, the, the detailed digitized manufacturing instructions for each of those those operations that, that that perhaps an operator needs to do, and then when it's all said and done, and and the, and the assembly is complete and ready to move on to the, the the next operation, you know where does it go and how and how does it get there? Okay, and so by digitizing all of this information and delivering that to the plant to enable your plant personnel, an additional benefit benefit that you get is that you now have visualization into your working process and your product. Um, uh, processes that are that, that are that are going on in real time. You can look at this in real time and, and and view the current status of your of your schedule for the day, if you will. So now we've created the data, we've delivered the data. Um, what is the what is the next step? Well, we need to uh, we need to start collecting data back. Okay, so this is all about tightening con tightening up control on the uh, on your on your quality. Okay, so now we've got. A set of digitized quality forms, if you will, which you may be required to, to record data in, depending on your on your customer requirements or your or your your, your production environment, where you can now uh, either manually or automatically um, collect data of product and process data to enter into these forms, as well as as the functions are being performed to do your spec validations 
uh, right there as it's happening rather than collecting the information and validating it later. Um, and then in the event that there, there is a, uh, uh, something that's out of tolerance or out of spec, you've got some non-conformance management that gives you, gives you some, uh, a set of uh, digitized procedures on what to do with that uh, if there is an issue, to get the right people there to, to correct the problem or, or to route the, uh, the product to, to an area where it gets repaired. Um, and all this gets documented uh, along the way. Okay, so, so we've, we've created the data, we've delivered the data, we've collected the data. That's all so far has been within the four walls of our, uh, of our manufacturing plant, if you will, or our production environment. So, so what's the next step? Well, the next step is uh, to uh, um, expand that into the, into the supply chain. Okay, so let's expand that visibility and integrate the supply chain uh, WIP, if you will, or work and process into the into the current WIP, WIP visibility that we have within the plant, okay? And this is about digitizing your outsource operations and delivering those to the supplier, as well as when you receive product back, to have a digitized form of the certificates of analysis to prove that what they've delivered is per the specifications that, that you and your customers require. So we've now created the data, we've delivered the data, we've collected the data, we've expanded the data collection and, and delivery to the, to the supply chain, the final step here is that um, every step along the way, we've, we've built some comprehensive product records or as-built data um, to give you some product genealogy of, of, the, uh, of the product that's uh, ultimately being shipped into your, into your customer's hands, okay? And this includes all the components that went into that, the sub-assemblies, sub any substitutions or alternatives that may have, uh, have been performed to give you the ability to do some traceability for, and, and some analytics for, for a couple of reasons. One is to, is to, is to feed that beta data back into your, into your engineering to, to perhaps do some uh, analysis on how to improve uh, the design of the product or the manufacturability of the product. Also, it gives you the data to, uh, uh, to do some uh, uh, warranty exposure containment in the event that you have a failure in the, in the field. Okay, so the goal here at the end of this journey is, is that as is, is you follow all the way through is that, is that you've now turned those challenges that we talked about earlier into benefits in your manufacturing process. You know, you're able to produce your products faster, reduce your whip, tighten up your control on quality, streamline the supply chain, and, and reduce your warranty costs. Okay, so that's, that's, a, that's a walk through the, 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 the journey and the, and the methodology that we get to the, uh, we get to the, the uh, integrated systems and the elimination of paper and digitation, digitization of your processes along the way. Um, what, I'm, what I'm going to talk about next is some specific functionality within the manufacturing execution system. Um, and then I'm going to turn it back to Matt to talk about the engineering side, and then Matt will walk us through a, a uh, a use case, if you will, on how this all flows together. So the first, the first thing I wanted to talk about in the in the MES system is is all about um, you know a templatized approach for, for quick deployment. This is about digitizing your 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 manufacturing instructions and and giving you the ability to create some real time real time workflows, if you will, to uh, uh, to to give the operators a step by step operational methodology to walk through the work that they need to do on a given on a given assembly and at the same time do the appropriate air proofing uh, during that that step-by-step -step process okay so this is intended to give you the, the the ability online if you will to, to lean your processes to uh, to improve and eliminate steps as you as you as, as you need to and it gives you the ability to to uh, manage and audit audit your uh, production processes uh, in real time more effectively um, it's also customizable, so depending on the, uh, um, the roles and the functions of the, of the operators that the, that, the, that the instructions are being delivered to, you can, tailor, um, you can tailor the work instructions to meet the individual work styles and or decision-making authority, if you will, uh, associated with that, with that person. So then we've created the instructions. We need to do something with those now, right? So this is all about this is all about the operator experience here and delivering that uh, or dispatching those work orders to the to the operators and, and to the production line, um, and it gives you the ability to to control the flow of your product um, um, by dispatching the work at the right time in the right place for 
for a given a given operation. It gives the ability to uh, to track your your labor, if you will. It supports uh, alternate or variant routing and operations in the event that you may have material shortages or machine downs or, or something going on in your plant where you need to do something different for that day. It gives you the ability to to enforce uh, priorities and business rules so that, such that perhaps an operator is not permitted to go on to the next step until he actually confirms that he's done something and input inputs data around that. Um, another key thing here is, is that typically you may have a, a stationary terminal, if you will, in, in, a, in a workstation where an operator is doing work. Um, you may have a situation where, where the environment is not conducive to that. We have the ability to uh, expand this to a mobile device um, for your operators to use. Okay, so now we get into to WIP material management. Again, this, this is, again, about real-time visibility into your plant floor. Okay, this gives you the ability to prioritize your work again based on ex current conditions, exceptions, and exceptions in your, in your production schedules, if you will. This data can also be used to, to drive some um, production monitors, uh, WIP status displays you ha may have uh, throughout your, your production environment for your plants, your, uh, your, your plant line supervisors or your operators or your production staff to, to, uh, to visually see um, quickly where they are during their schedules for the day. It gives you the ability to, to, to zoom into the full visibility of your shop order details. And again, this is also can be tailored based on the role of the, uh, uh, of the, of the person logged into the system to, uh, um, to view it. They can have various views depending on their, uh, um, their responsibilities. Quality management, again, it's, a, it's all about uh, data collection here. And, and here we provide some, some flexible designer uh, uh, forms, if you will, to build your, 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 your quality forms and collect the data and apply the data to that. So you can do uh, uh, full specification limits and target enforcement by product and operation here. You got support for both product and process data, support for manual and automatic data collection um, during, your, during your build process. And then finally, it comes down to uh, product record management and that, and that comprehensive uh, product record, okay? And it gives you the ability here at the end, at the end of when it's all said and done, to have a digitized form of what used to be your paper-based traveler or your data book or your shop book, whatever you may call that, with a comprehensive set of, uh, of product data that includes process data, traceability data, quality and test data, labor data, non-conformance data, all associated with for that individual product that's going out the door in order to, in order to help you do um, uh, analytics in the future. So with that, I'll turn it back to Matt and let him tell us about the engineering side. Okay, thanks, Jack. So PTC uh, pro flagship product and PLM is PTC Windchill and what Winchell allows you to do is optimize the product life cycle. So up in the product design and engineering area, we allow engineers to completely define the digital product and have comprehensive product data management, help standardize and automate product life cycle business processes, including bringing best practices to companies to help them with this uh, automation and improving their overall business processes. We help track and manage quality throughout the product life cycle, especially up in uh, the engineering and product design. And then uh, we help analyze product performance across multiple dimensions. And this management of information is a critical part of what we're talking about here when we're able to improve the overall manufacturing process, being able to take this information that we're managing, integrate it directly with uh, our management and execution and uh, produce better processes. So I mentioned earlier, if you peel back the layer of what uh, a complete product, digital product representation looks like, you can see it includes a complete def digital definition of the product. This includes the mechanical definition, whether it be from a PTC's CAD product or other third-party CAD products. It includes the electrical definition, which could include the schematic or the board. This information is also uh, captured alongside the software that could go into that. And you're now starting to capture a full mechatronic uh, definition of the product. We also include the calculations. So an important part of uh, engineering today is to capture the knowledge 
of the engineers who are there now so future generations can leverage that information and improve the designs. And then the technical documentation and illustrations that come out of all this engineering material have to be managed and they want to be rich with all the product information that was designed by the engineers. At the bottom, I mentioned comprehensive visualization. This is part of a, a robust PLM system. It allows the stakeholders who are involved in the product design to participate in the process and provide feedback. And it also leads to better decisions. So you can view the mechanical, the electrical, cross highlight those to understand exactly what's happening in the design. And then over on the right, you can see that we're talking about a highly complex product configuration. So as you start to bring together all these definitions, mechanical, electrical, software, the documentation, even out to the proper vendor or manufacturer, uh, you end up with a very complex configuration that evolves over the uh, life cycle of the product. And being able to manage that evolution and being able to tra have traceability and do reporting on differences is a key aspect of, of managing the product life cycle. And again, taking this information now and infusing the MES system with this great information is what we're uh, talking about today. So as Jack mentioned, I'm going to go through a uh, quick use case to give you an idea of the solution overview that we're talking about. There's a few steps, starting with uh, design, going through, again, the definition of manufacturing, the planning, connecting to our execution system, operating and executing the steps, doing some quality inspection, closing the loop on that quality inspection, and then uh, compare the as designed with as built. So in the uh, first part, we're talking about the what to build. So again, as we mentioned in the ideal system, the what to build includes a design engineer who creates a new design based on some sort of customer requirements. This new design in the early stages will include thought process for design for manufacturing. Uh, even include participation from manufacturing folks in the review using the visualization of the uh, digital definition that I just mentioned. They can provide feedback and uh, put in design ideas to improve manufacturability. From there, the design engineer can even define critical quality dimensions. Those dimensions can be picked up by the quality engineer, might develop an FMEA off of that, and that would lead directly to the uh, control plans that we'd see later on after the uh, design process. From that early stage of defining the information of the product, then we move into how to build it. This is where we start the planning of manufacturing. And uh, up front, we want to create some process plans. A corporate manufacturing engineer would do this uh, today now using the rich 3D information that was made available from the design engineer. They can start to lay out specific steps, uh, lay out a manufacturing bill of material. They, again, can include items like the critical quality dimensions to make sure that those are being uh, carried and propagated throughout the entire process. This information uh, is very critical from a corporate standpoint. If you want to enforce a process standard throughout, say, multiple manufacturing sites, and because we're doing this in the context of PLM, this uh, planning can actually take place while the design engineer is still working on the, the design itself. So this can happen in parallel, thus improving and speeding the time to manufacture. Once we have the uh, information, the work instructions can be automatically generated out of the uh, information that was done in the process planning. And again, you can see here we're including not only part numbers and information, but the rich 3D uh, model geometry that, that would be helpful to uh, folks further on down in the process. And then from here, this information is integrated now with GE Prophecy, and that would pass directly down to the next step, where our plant manufacturing engineer is now going to think about production. They need to work the specific routes that are going to be put in place. But the great news is they're not starting from scratch. They're now bringing that information that we just passed from design and engineering they can take that, pick that up, start to work on specific things that are necessary for a particular location or plant. They can use, define those routes, uh, send those out to be released, uh, get approval, release those to production. And you can see then our operators would then start to pick up these work instructions. And as we saw earlier, the rich geometry and design information that came from engineering would now be available here to the operator. This is going to help them make decisions on their job, make sure they can link back to find out 
exactly uh, answers to questions that they might have about the, the product design itself. Once the operators are finished with uh, actual production, we then go to quality and inspection. Again, the quality inspection information, uh, that's going to pick up on the information that we started back again in design where we identified critical dimensions and control plans. This, uh, the quality engineers can then start to uh, record this information and if there's an issue, they can start a nonconformance. So in this uh, particular step, we're taking information that would come out of uh, our quality or inspection that might generate a nonconformance. That information can be tracked with our backbone of quality that we talked about earlier. We can take a look for trends in nonconformances, and when appropriate, we can launch a uh, corrective action to take care of this. That kappa might actually lead to an engineering change notice. And because this information is happening within the PLM system, once we make our change to the uh, design itself, that's going to propagate back down through the process plan, the manufacturing information, and back down into our MES environment. Again, our corporate engineer, manufacturing engineer, is going to be notified of the change. They're going to be able to verify, take a look at it, approve the change, make sure that they're setting the proper disposition on uh, appropriate uh, routes. This information will then be updated and uh, be available to the operators, again, down on the shop floor. So very quickly and with a closed loop process, we're now making sure that we're capturing the information, taking action on that information, and that information is very quickly being updated uh, where needed on the shop floor. And then to uh, completely close the loop, because we now have captured as the as-built information, as Jack talked about in, in the journey slide, we can compare that information with the as-designed that is coming from engineering and we can very quickly understand the differences that might be there. And this is going to be uh, valuable, especially as we start going out into a service environment where we need to make uh, appropriate calls on what is actually built and out in the field. So that takes you through a, a very quick use case to kind of give you an idea of uh, how this will uh, operate from uh, one end to the next. It certainly addresses many of the challenges and it leads to many important improvements. And for that, I'm going to turn it back over to Bob to discuss uh, some of those improvements. Thank you, Matt. Yep, having a little problem with the screen. Okay, sorry about that. We will uh, get back to that. So <clears throat> what I really want to talk to you about is the improvements that all of this does. I mean, this connection and interconnection between, you know, two um, really amazing um, pieces of equipment with BTC's PLM system and, and GE's manufacturing uh, system really gains values. And I know when you look at these numbers, there's going to be a bunch of you sitting there going, oh, my God, that's really large, and I don't believe it. These are actuals. And you know we're willing to talk to you about those. I just want to skim across a few of them as you're reading it. Uh, you know, reducing manufacturing costs by 20%. You can see how big that number can get when you can do improvements to your manufacturing flow, as Jack had mentioned earlier. You know, reducing your whip inventory or reducing your investigation times on warranties. You know, 70% on your reduction time. You're not digging through the paper to try to figure out what's going on. It's all there at your fingertips. It's it's Google search. It's you know quick and easy. They're, we're not having to run out into the warehouse and try to figure out which box we threw that in when we made that part and trying to do that warranty investigation. You know, cycle time in production. You know, when you don't know where the whip is and you're out there trying to find it, you know that that's an easy and simple thought on cycle time. But think about the way you're working your systems and the paper records and the things you're trying to fill out as you're going along. You'll start to realize that these numbers aren't that unrealistic. And they are big because of the volumes and, and the works that you're doing in your factories. So we welcome you to talk to us more about the values that are in, in, in and around the, the factory that we find when we install these uh, two uh, wonderful products. And I do want to talk to you a little bit about that because, you know, 28 years in manufacturing, the one thing I can tell you is if you really truly want control of total cost of ownership, you really have to go with best of breed. 
GE's practiced this for quite some time. That's why we're open and layered and can connect to any pieces of equipment that's out there, whether it's 50 years old or 50 minutes old. It's our best-in-class solutions philosophy that brought us to such a wonderful company like PTC. Uh, they have the technologies that really help the engineering process get ready. It's running on steroids when you're using their product. And tying that in to our product to help manufacture it and give that tie back, like Jack was saying, is just giving us the phenomenal customer value. I'd like to end just for another second or two, kind of reminding you where those values were. Jack and Matt carried them through on the presentation very nicely, but think about the shorter production, the release times, the closed loop of being able to understand what was made as it was being made and how it matches the as-built. Those are really the large pieces that you need to think about. And with that, I would love to turn it over to questions and answers. And thank you for your time. Excellent. Thanks, Bob. Um, I, we have a few minutes for a couple questions from the audience. I encourage you, if you haven't already, to submit a question via the chat function on your screen. But we do have a couple that we could start with right now. And um, one was about um, the fact that uh, uh, the, um, the writer says, my um, company installed an ERP system, and um, uh, my management thinks that that's uh, doing a sufficient enough job. Um, what, did it, what is it about uh, an MES solution that um, provides additional benefit? Okay, so 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 I think the question is, what additional value does an MES solution provide over 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 a traditional ERP system? So I, I'll I'll mm -hmm. chime, Jack. I'll I'll chime in here. Um, the uh, uh, and, and and perhaps Bob, you can you can echo some of this. But the MES system is going to give you a more detailed step-by-step -step definition of you know for your shop floor personnel. Okay. Um, in addition, your MES system has a has the ability to directly connect to the plant floor, to your machines, to your operators. Um, some of which an ERP system does, but an MES is more inclined to, to talk down to the machine level, as well as give you the ability to do some some uh, um, some resource certification at the operator and/or machine level. Um, and then, given the 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 inherent nature of an MES system, being able to integrate your quality data collection with your work instructions as things are being built and then tying that back into your MES system and back into your PLM system is, is, is something that, uh, um, that is an absolute must if you want to you wanna tie these systems together. Yeah, Jack, I think I reflect on that a little bit too. I mean, you know, when you think of it, think of the ERP system as its traditional use. It's a back office machinery type of, uh, you know, order the parts, make sure I've got the right specifications. When you look at an MES layer, it's on the shop floor, tied to that piece of equipment, tied to that person, helping them through that workflow. And you're gathering that data as you're doing it. So it's a much different kind of data that you're collecting than you would on an ERP. And even if you bring an ERP out to the shop floor, it doesn't have that flow capability or that machine connection capability that a traditional MES layer product would have. Okay, thank you. Um, another question regarding the the three parts coming together is is there do you have any information on um, where you might find the biggest return on investment or impact be among or between PLM MES and ERP? Um, Matt, would you would you like to take that one? Sure, thanks, Jack. So uh, certainly there are, are many areas that we see when you bring these systems together in terms of value to, to uh, a manufacturing environment. Uh, one of these is uh, new product introduction and the speed with which you can get products out to the market. Uh, it, again, if you can have systems that are integrated and working together, uh, you can eliminate a lot of the manual steps that are just inherent in today's processes. So that's something that's there. But I think maybe even a bigger one is uh, the quality aspect that we talked about. Uh, many customers are looking to improve quality and to have the uh, design information early on, understand quality with uh, planning uh, and pass that information out to what is happening in the execution environment, capture all that uh, information real time 
and then be able to sync that back together and tie it into what's uh, in present in the ERP system from uh, you know parts management and supplier those type of things. Uh, the the improvement in quality uh, definitely is an area that we think uh, customers will uh, uh, really appreciate. Okay. If I, and if I could add to that, this is Jack. You know, I, I, something we don't often think about is, is that as you increase that quality, you know, then then you've got that, that impacts serviceability. Okay, better design, better manufacturing, better quality. In the end, I mean, you would you would think by doing all that that you've got better products. You should see your service costs um, reduce as well. Got it. Um, a question about. Um, the effort it takes in terms of implementation of a system like this. Can you speak to what might be a typical either implementation timeline or team size? What does it take? It, it sounds like a very extensive system. Bob? Yeah, I think that uh, you have to kind of look at your uh, drivers as Jack had the green uh, stop, uh, stop signs up there and decide which area to go after first. I, I wouldn't uh, I would take this in a very phased approach. You want to be uh, exciting your customers, your internal customers on the shop floor as well as your, your management team uh, in the factory as you go. So you implement this in a very phased approach and we're very used to that. Uh, it's how we roll it out uh, with our customers. And it gives you a, a short, easy wins all along the way. And the beauty is you stop where you want to. So if you only have one area like WIP to tackle, and that's where you want to start and you make a resounding and wonderful thing. Everything that you're doing for that is going to help you with all the other ones. So you're moving through a process of saying, I still have the data, I still have the capability, but I'm just going to focus in on this area. I get that one understood, I'm going to go to this area. So the work effort to the next area is not as big and everybody gets in tune with it. Yeah, the, this is Jack, so the, inc the inclination is, is that this, this, this looks great and the inclination is to go off and try to solve all your problems at once. Um, and I guess the, the message there that we've gotten back from, from, from a number of different customers is, is, that, is to give up on perfection. Like Bob said, pick, pick, pick a business driver that, that, that's impacting your ability to, to deliver the right quality and to deliver products on time and focus there. Um, start, start small and, and, and get, get, you know, grow from there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, thank um, you. If I could oh, add ahead. in there as well, I think uh, an important point that uh, we brought out here today is with PTC and GE working together, we have uh, worked to integrate our system so that a lot of uh, what would have been a challenging situation for you as the customer to do on your own, we work through that to obviously help the, the process of implementation as well. So. Okay. We had a question about um, standards. Are there standards that exist for digitizing manufacturing processes and or how do you ensure a long-term solution in this situation? I'm going to turn to Bob once again. Yeah, I was going to say, let me, let me take that one, Jack. This is a passion of mine, so it's, uh, I could go on for the next uh, two hours on it, but I'm going to answer it in about two minutes. There are plenty of standards groups out there that are working on best practices. I think they all boil down to a very important process step for you to think about. How do you model your plant and what do you need to model in your data? They're very simple, they're very easy. You'd be surprised at how easy they are when you look at your process flow that you already know and say, ah, I need to collect this data at workstation one. I need this machine number two. This is a pretty standard looking machine to me. I use it three times. I make the same data collections and data entries the same way and it flows very quickly. And, and our products are kind of built around that model. We call it, it's a, there's an S95 model from the SA, uh, ISA, if you want to really look at a specific model for that. Um, but any best practice standards group out there will have that same kind of data modeling. And that's what's going to make it go faster. It's also going to allow you to keep the total cost of ownership down. Gotcha. Um, a question about mobile devices. The question is, um, are you seeing um, many situations where um, data input kiosks or fixed terminals can be um, replaced or improved by putting data collection on mobile devices? Yeah, let me take that one, Jack, and sorry for hogging the answer on this one, Matt. I'll let you go next. But uh, 
We do, and, and I think you have to look at that realistically, right? I mean, if you're building a jet engine and it's on a, uh, it's on a transient crane that's got about 100 tons and it's the thing moving along, you, you may not be as mobile as you'd like to be. You know, you can't hold the, the mobile device as you're tightening the wrench. Um, but if you think about it and walk through your factory, there's a lot of places where mobility can really work. And I often want people to think about that as the, uh, you know, you walk into Home Depot and how do they do their inventory? They push around a cart and it's got everything on it they need. So you think about things like that as you're designing out your, your digitization and it'll go a lot faster and easier for you. Okay. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll add in there too, Bob. I think uh, as things are becoming mobile, which is clearly, uh, you know, the way that uh, most uh, organizations are moving, it's the information that you're able to uh, put into that mobile or make accessible through the mobile device. So do you want someone on the shop floor able to actually access you know, rich product information, illustrations on how the product is to be assembled or disassembled, uh, same thing with services organization. So as you're thinking about a mobile strategy, you want to think about what information do you want uh, that particular person to be able to access through that mobile device, and that's uh, an important part of the, the thought process. Okay. Another question, um, an attendee wants to know, is there a facility within GE that simulates these tools in, in a real-life situation? And is there a presentation or a tour available so I can see how it works? Uh, this is Jack. Um, we do have well, a simulator, um, we do have a demo system that we can demonstrate the functionality, um, either in person or, or by webinar such as this. Um, we do have um, some installations within General Electric that we'd, uh, we'd, we'd be happy to arrange a visit to um, to, show you, to show you how they're implementing it and where they're implementing it at. Um, so there is, a, there is some options there, yes. Yeah, and we have a few videos we can send you as well, so that uh, you know we get we get you more interested before we bring you in our factory. Gotcha. Um, another question: Do your products typically support data collection and analysis at the run, or lot, or unit level? Do you perceive benefits of one over the other? Uh, let me take this one. Uh, you know, so from a manufacturing standpoint, we are set up for all, and I really do believe it's the type of process that you're uh, engaging in. And it very specifically comes down to the piece of equipment or, or, or product that you're making as to which one is better for you. Uh, you probably don't want to go too crazy changing that while you're digitizing unless you know it's really badly broken. Uh, we had an example of badly broken in uh, GE lighting simply because we changed the technology from the high pressure sodium to an LED. That gave us a wildly good opportunity just to really look at the whole process and change ourselves and the way we set ourselves up and the way we run. So if you've got that kind of example, I would definitely look at the whole process step and the way you set yourself up. But there's no real wrong way to do this. You've, you've got tons of experience on how you run now. We had a related question that's pretty specific. Um, how does Prophecy connect with legacy controllers on the shop floor? Uh, it is our it is history <laughs> that, we, that we connect with uh, with lots of legacy controllers. And I'll, I'll give you the example. I mean, we have pieces of equipment that could be 50 years old. You know, if we're lucky, they got about two or three relays and a, and a couple of buttons and maybe a temperature we wanted off the darn thing. Uh, our capabilities between our, our automation and our hardware is to, you know, drop a data concentrator in there as a piece of hardware, or if you had a controller already on it, we carry about 500 drivers for communication across about 30 years worth of controllers that are out there. So I'm pretty sure yeah, we're not going to run into one that we can't solve because we haven't yet. And if we do, there's the ability, there is a, there is a, a driver, a communications toolkit that, that, that you can build one as well. Yep. Great. 
Well, that's all the questions that we have time for today. If there were any questions that were submitted that we didn't get to, there is the ability for um, our presenters to get back to you via email, so um, they will be notified of all of those questions and have that opportunity. I'd like to thank Bob, Jack, and Matt for their presentations today, and thank all the attendees who asked the questions. A recording of this webinar will be available starting tomorrow for future viewing or sharing. Visit www.automationworld.com to access it and other on-demand programming. Thank you and have a great day.